right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Access California podcast. My name is Stefan Thomas. I am the advocacy director here um, with Access California for Cal Voices. And I am here with Miss Claire Courtright. Hi, Claire. Hi. This is fun. Glad we're doing this again. My name is Claire Courtright. Um, I am the policy director for Cal Voices. Um, I'm an attorney and I'm a person with lived experience of serious mental illness. Welcome back, Miss Claire. We're, we're both excited to be here. Um, last time we talked a little bit about sort of Prop 1, some of the changes and modernization of the Mental Health Services Act, MHSA, uh, which is now sort of morphing into BHSA, so Behavioral Health um, uh, Services Act. And today uh, we thought we'd take a little bit of a break from um, our intended pathway, which I think will be SB 43 uh, next week um, to talk about a, a report uh, called Stuck um, by the DRC, so Disability Rights California. Uh, we're just going to chat a little bit about it today. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll jump in. Yeah, um, please. <laughs> just first for people who don't know, um, by federal law, every state in the country has to have what's called a protection and advocacy um, agency for the protection and advocacy of all disabled people. Um, so in California, that agency, that federal, uh, federally mandated agency is Disability Rights California. Um, and very recently in March of this year, um, DRC put out a horrifying report um, about the practice of excessive and illegal institutionalization of people with serious mental illness um, who are essentially being over detained in the Los Angeles County Jail with no criminal charges and also in um, mental health facilities, but that are locked when um, it's already been determined that there is no need for them to be there. Um, so with that little introduction, um, I'll go ahead and let Stefan ask me some questions about this. Um, and I'll give some background as it comes up on on the law um, and uh, why this is illegal and it and it needs to stop. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, Claire, for the introduction. Just to, just to kind of build on to that, what the DRC found was that more than eight hundred people were locked in these mental health facilities um, that did not uh, did not need to be there, and this is all dependent on a waiting list. Can you tell us a little bit more about? how these folks got locked up, um, what these waiting lists are all about, uh, and why are they still there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first, um, we've got folks in the LA County Jail, large numbers of folks in the LA County Jail with serious mental illness who have no criminal charges. And so one may ask, you know, how did they end up there? Um, the typical path, um, according to this report, and I've, I've seen similar things happen in other jails, um, is, you know, a person will be, a person who's manifestly seriously mentally ill will be arrested, usually on a petty charge, um, and then they will be found incompetent to stay on trial. Their mental illness is so severe that they can't participate in their own defense. Um, and when the charges are not serious, or even sometimes when a person might be found not guilty by reason of insanity and the charge isn't serious, the DA can and will sometimes drop those charges. So it looks like that's what is happening to folks in the LA County Jail. So these folks are going in and they are incompetent to stand trial, non-restorable, and um, the charges are being dropped, but then they're stuck in the jail. They're still incarcerated and under the auspices of a civil commitment, under the auspices of a, what's called a conservatorship where the state has essentially placed you under a guardianship saying you can't provide for your food, clothing and shelter, which allows them to control uh, where you live, including placing you in a locked facility. Um, so what's happening with these folks in the LA County jail um, is they are under conservatorship of the public guardian. So the government, essentially the local government in LA, a local government entity, um, and they're being over over detained in the jail. There are also significant numbers of people in locked facilities. And this business about waiting lists, it's really, mm, 
It's really that the conservator, the public guardian feels that the person should be placed long term in a locked mental health facility. Um, And so the folks that are in jail, they want to transfer them into locked mental health facilities, but those facilities don't have any beds. Um, And then we've got folks in the locked mental health facilities who should be transferred out according to their doctors. They don't need to be there and they are simply not being transferred out because we have a lack of housing options for people with um, serious mental illness in California. So that's sort of the, the setup of how folks are, are, um, why this is currently happening. Yeah. And, you know, and you and I spoke, um, last week, we had a brilliant conversation about this and about some of the conditions that, that folks that, you know, have SMI that, um, are, are enduring as they are, uh, obtaining treatments in, in these, um, in these facilities. Um, can you, can you just kind of share a little bit about, you know, what you found when it comes to treatment, um, in, you know, in these facilities and jails, single housing units, what were, what were, um, some of those key points that, that you found? Yeah. Um, I, I will say some of my personal experience working in, you know, acute, psych in jails um, is exactly what the DRC report finds, right? So um, if you have a serious mental illness and you're in a local jail, what typically happens, especially if you're seriously mentally ill, medications don't work particularly well for you, um, you're usually in segregated housing. So you might be, you know, you'll be on some kind of unit that is only for people with serious mental illness. And what I have seen and what this report found is that Um, folks who are on these, you know, sometimes they're called special management units or, you know, there's different phrases for it, but folks on these units are typically in single cells and they're being held in solitary confinement. Um, And I've seen this in jails and the reason for it is those jails aren't staffed um, to um, supervise and keep safe a population or this is the jail's excuse anyways, it could not be the case, but you know, the perspective of jail is, you know, they have this entire unit full of people with the most severe and unremitting mental illness. And they have, you know, a couple COs assigned to that unit, you know, and you would compare to some kind of other facility where there are trained, um, skilled staff and, and high staff ratios. So, you know, and this is what this report found is that, um, the use of solitary confinement for folks with no criminal charges in a jail was routine. Um, and I think it's also really important to understand how long people are being over detained in the jail. Um, and, and there's a huge racial disparity too, but I think the, the typical length of being over detained in the jail, um, lasted anywhere from, um, a couple of months to, um, nearly a year. Um, so we're not, this isn't, you know, folks being, um, detained, you know, over detained for a couple of days. This is significant periods of time. This is folks um, in solitary confinement um, in in these segregated units, um, you know, really with no one to get them out. Yeah, and a, and a really great example of this that is in the DRC report is um, there was a woman who uh, was was what was on a waiting list, and and it, and it appeared as if she was preparing to be released, but she had been. Um, she'd been given some, some pretty harmful treatment. There has been some, uh, some physical restraints and, um, you know, in, in one moment she, she sort of had a, uh, a mental health crisis, uh, and, and potential substance use crisis. And, um, they, they determined that she was yet again, um, un, unfit to, to take care of herself. Um, and she described the experience as, um, incredibly harmful and frightening and, um, and, and, you know, was, uh, exposed to, um, a lot of maltreatment, uh, illegal, um, sort of holding as well, um, as, you know, PTSD as a result to these experiences. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we know everything we need to know about the effects of solitary confinement, even on people without mental illness. And we've known it for a long time. It's indisputable that it is profoundly harmful, that it results in um, often results in additional mental illnesses, right? I mean, you may walk in with, um, you know, a diagnosis of schizophrenia and walk out with schizophrenia and PTSD. So it's really, it's really unconscionable. And I also would like to just emphasize um, how many people this is, um, affecting out of the entire population 
you know, of people that are conserved in L.A. County. Um, you know, according to the report, there's 4,600 people under a conservatorship, so basically a guardianship um, by L.A. County. And um, half, about half of them, about 2,300 people, the conservator, the person responsible for them, is the county. It's the county public guardian's office. And the county public, you know, the number of people, this 800 people that are either in the jail or um, illegally being over-detained in locked treatment facilities, um, it's about 40%. So 40% of, you know, the people who have been taken into the, you know, essentially a protective custody by the county of LA are actually uh, being harmed in those um being harmed in those arrangements um, and having their rights violated. And, you know, I think it's not going to shock anyone that there's absolutely case law in California that says, no, you cannot put a conserved person in jail. Jails are designed and exist to punish for crimes. Folks who, um, you know, do not have charges um, and folks that are just, uh, you know, conserved due to mental illness cannot be placed in jails. Um, You know, and and similarly, the over-detention in locked um, psychiatric facilities also violates an important Supreme Court case called Olmstead, which is based in the Americans with Disability Act, which is our main anti-discrimination statute for people with disabilities. Um, and, you know, keeping folks, um, you know, for a governmental entity to keep folks in locked facilities when there is no quote unquote need for them to be there is segregation. It's illegal segregation of the disabled um, and it's a form of discrimination. Um, The case does get a little nuanced around money and and when the state has to actually move people into community uh, unlocked, you know, real community housing. um, It shouldn't be there should be no nuance around money. There is. Um, but in the case of, um, you know, the Los Angeles County, another thing, the, re- the report just sort of, um, you know, if you want to find the exact um, quotes um, while we talk, you know, the cost of keeping people in the jails illegally yes. is astronomical compared to the cost of um, hosting them in the community and providing um, community-based uh, you know, outpatient unlocked services. So, I mean, there's just absolutely no leg for LA County to stand on here. And, 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 and speaking of costs, I actually have those numbers here, right? So there's currently four, 430 people that are on these wait lists, um, uh, uh, towards some sort of housing or, um, safe release. Cause I know safe releases is something. And so they're, they're, they're currently being held in these facilities. Um, and these 430 people can benefit Pretty much from intensive case management, intensive mental health uh, services, which would cost roughly five thousand dollars a month per person, right? So, if you're adding this up um, in terms of the cost of housing, and this is this is in this report, uh, it could save LA County three point seven uh, three point seven five million uh, monthly instead of this sort of uh, sort of this this feigned incarceration uh, without any sort of criminal charges. So the, the amount of money that is going into this is, is completely astronomical um, for something that, you know, really kind of uh, infringes on, uh, on, on the rights of, of humans, right? Um, and yeah. specifically targeted uh, towards, towards individuals living with severe mental illness. And as we're going to kind of talk about later, those that um, might be diagnosed with some sort of substance abuse disorder, um, I know that's kind of, we're kind of di- diving into our next com- conversation, but, uh, would you, w- w- can you kind of provide everyone sort of a, um, a little glimpse of what that might look like when it comes to, uh, new structures around conservatorships and how, uh, you know, how the individuals that are stuck in LA, uh, how this might sort of be replicated when it comes to people that have substance abuse disorder. Yeah, um, I I will pivot, um, but I do I, I will pivot and I will address that in just a minute. But sure. this is I just wanted to pull out one more um, data point from this report around money and the cost of doing this because you know I just think people should hear it because it's so shocking. And yeah, you can find absolutely. this report online if you Google Disability Rights California and stuck uh, or stuck in LA County Jail, you'll find it. It'll come right up. But um, this is a quote from that report. A single day in the Los Angeles County Jail's mental health unit for people with serious mental disabilities cost $650,000. 
um, $650 per person for a total of $19,760 per person per month. Right. And it's really, really difficult for me to understand why Los Angeles County or the Los Angeles County Public Guardian's Office would have a preference um, for keeping these folks in jail when they clearly are um, spending astronomical amounts of money. And it's really difficult to see, you know, even if you wanted to go, you know, get a room at the Ritz Carlton and staff it with private staff to get these folks out of jail, I'm pretty sure it would cost less than $20,000 a month. So it's just, um, you know, I, I, when I read this as a person with serious mental illness, as a person who's fought to get clients out of solitary confinement in jail and fought for people with serious mental illnesses in jails, um, uh, I see this as, as just incredibly mean, nasty, yeah. that, that, um, there's a level of disregard, um, and a level of almost malice towards this population, um, on behalf of these people who have, you know, again, take purported to take them into a form of productive protective custody. Um, I, I just want to, you know, I will pivot to, you know, why we're so concerned that this is about to massively expand in California and it is. Um, and, um, you know, I just wanted to, um, uh, make one more point with respect to this happening, which is that, um, you know, the report says that LA County, um, the LA County Sheriff's department has changed its policy. It no longer wants to over detain people with serious mental illness who are awaiting beds in the community, no criminal charges on a conservatorship. Um, and when this report was published in March, um, the uh, the the public report I forget exactly what it's called. It's called like a daily um, a daily something briefing from the LA County Sheriff's um, that says how many people are uh, being over detained. Um, in March, it was 126 people. Um, I just checked for June. It's 147. So whatever Los Angeles County, um, you know, has to say with respect to having changed their policy, you're not seeing um, you're not seeing this stop immediately. Um, we're not seeing any lawsuits yet um, with respect to these folks. Um, and, and, you know, there someone should take up that um, take up that mantle and take up that case because, um, you know, simply knowing the public knowing this is occurring doesn't solve the problem for the folks that are being um, blatantly illegally detained in the Los Angeles County Jail. Um, so, you know, I mean, that being said, and I also will point out one more thing is that if you, you know, if you look, go look at these public reports from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department that recite, you know, the people who are Department of Mental Health Charges dropped, awaiting transfer. This has been going on for years. Mm. This goes back years that the county has been doing this. Um, you know, so the number of people harmed in that time is is probably pretty high. Um, and then, you know, I know you wanted me to to pivot to um, talking about um, Senate Bill Forty Three which was, um, or is rather, a law that was passed last year through the legislature. Um, it took effect technically January 1 of this year, but there was an option for counties to delay the law taking effect for up to two years, so until January 1, 2026. And what Senate Bill 43 does is massively expand the population of people who can be placed under these conservatorships, guardianships, um, you know, by their local government, which is, you know, as I said, legally the prerequisite step to placing folks in locked facilities. Um, so Senate Bill 43 for the first time in California, and really I, I'm beginning to believe it's fairly unique without the, throughout the country, although that takes some research to know what all 50 states are doing. Um, what that bill did is say anyone with a quote severe substance use disorder um who due to that substance use disorder is unable to provide for their own food clothing and shelter or perceived to be unable to protect themselves or not attending essentially to some kind of physical medical issue that's sufficiently serious those people can be placed now those people can be treated exactly like the mentally ill Right. So they can be placed on short term holds. Everybody knows the 5150 in California and the series of holds that total 77 days on short term holds. 
but now they can also be conserved, which means they may soon be in exactly the same boat as, you know, um, uh, these folks that are being, um, you know, illegally um, held in locked facilities on the mental health side. Um, and, uh, you know, I know we talked about maybe exploring this law a little bit because on the surface, it seems, I think, reasonable to various members, members of the public if the substance use disorder is severe enough and, you know, depending on, on what's going on for the person. But as soon as you scratch a little bit beneath the surface, you start seeing real issues. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I kind of, I want to double back a little bit because, you know, as we're making this connection, I, I found this, um, this sort of grid, uh, in this report, um, that talks about the average length of stay, um, the number of folks that are in placement, uh, the people that are the number of folks that are waiting, uh, for placement. And these are numbers, uh, from LA County from 2021 and 2022, um, and, and what we're seeing here is that those locked beds, the average length of stay is two years, right? There's almost, almost 1,200 people that are, that are in these locked beds, um, and 407 people are on the wait list uh, with an average wait time of 146 days, right? So we're looking at, you know, five or six months of of being in these jails or in these, in these, these hospitals just to get into an actual locked facility for state hospitals. The length of stay is several years. Um, there's a 326 people on that wait list. Um, and the wait time is over 400 days, right? So we're seeing this more and more. And even though this, um, even though this report uh, speaks to roughly 800 people with 430 on on the wait list, you can see that two years ago uh, the numbers were 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 just as high. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's incredibly concerning. Um, you know, again, because we say that we say that we're taking these folks into a form of protective custody, and actually, what we're doing are things that are known and proven to be incredibly harmful, and we are not doing them for a quote unquote treatment purpose. Um, and I would like to pivot and get your perspective. You know, I want to bounce a couple of things off you with respect to yeah. Senate bill 43, because you have so much, you know, in-depth knowledge about, um, you know, SUD and, 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 you know, when we talk so many, um, you know, incredibly insightful things to say um, about, you know, what should be done to help people with serious substance use disorders. So the first thing that I want to get your reaction to is, um, you know, the state has not defined in law or said what it thinks is the treatment for severe substance use disorder. We know that it has now been placed in the law that these folks can be put in essentially, you know, the substance use version of a mental hospital um, and then conserved and placed, you know, long-term in locked facilities, as we see, you know, conservators, permanent conservatorships last a year, but they're renewable indefinitely. And so I just want to get your reaction, you know, to this idea that, you know, the reason for sort of placing you in a carceral facility is treatment, and yet the state has no idea what that treatment should be. And I just want to get your reaction to, you know, I, I mean, obviously... Um, you know, if you're in a locked facility, your access to obtain drugs is maybe limited. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's just a form of restraint, you know, it's it, a form of restraining people. It really is. Um, uh, access access to substances in, in jails are, in fact, limited, but the risks of, of getting those substances inside the jails and the quality of, of the substances uh, is, is undetermined. And a lot, a lot of jails are not equipped um, for, uh, for, you know, substance abuse detox or rehabilitation outside of, you know, 12 step models and groups and things like that. Um, so, so the, the conservatorship approach is likely to be more harmful because of the placement of, of folks that are, that are suffering from substance use disorder, um, in, into places that, that are just not set up they don't have the infrastructure to do so yeah um i will say we don't know whether you know what will happen to folks with sud is the same thing that's happening to folks with mental illness where 
you know, they come in with a drug charge, they drop the charge, um, conserve the person, and they're stuck in the Los Angeles County Jail. And that had not even occurred to me. We don't have we don't have the locked substance use disorder beds in California. He's never done this before. And when you know, um, Cal Voices was in primary opposition to the bill, and when we were working on it, I was, um, I I. I got an opinion, a legal opinion from some um, public defenders who are acquaintances of mine. And I said, you know, we just don't even know where these folks are going. And, and without hesitating, one of the public defenders said to me, they're going to jail. Mm. They're going to jail. And, you know, so even if we're not sort of, even if the locked facility in which people are being involuntarily placed for SUD is not a jail, even if it is, you know, sort of the SUD equivalent of a mental hospital, you know, to the extent that I understand, um, you know, how this law is being implemented in the two counties that are currently implementing it, which is San Luis Obispo and San Francisco, you know, they're, they're sort of having to make up what's the evidence-based treatment for SUD. And what you see them saying is medication assisted treatment. Yeah. You want to talk about like Matt and its role, because I know you're saying like some people think, you know, so, okay, so you're in this locked building, for substance use disorder, what are they going to do in that locked building? And you're like, well, you know, 12 step programs, you know, I mean, the abstinence is being enforced on you. So I don't even know that 12 step makes sense in the context where it's not voluntary. Um, you know, talk, yeah. talk therapy groups, um, you know, or process groups. Um, and then, you know, you're looking at medication assisted treatment. Yeah, and I think medica medication uh, assistant treatment does work. Um, it's done. Uh, it's had a, a a large and sometimes controversial impact on those that are um, that have you know uh, dependency on on opiates, um, and you know uh, Matt also has been um, pretty uh, effective when it comes to alcohol withdrawal and alcohol management. There are plenty of medications out there that that um, help. Uh, sort of folks kind of stay sober. Um, I think where it gets really challenging is as the rehabilitation uh, movement for, for SUD is starting to be more whole person centered and wellness centered, um, you're, you're not likely to see that in, in jails or uh, the SUD version of a, of a hospital. Um, because it only goes so far uh, when someone is, is forced treatment. Right, because there's no, there's no intrinsic reward. Right, when you're when you're voluntary voluntarily going into rehabs or you're going into twelve step programs, you're getting something out of it, and that's what kind of keeps you going to uh, to towards you know the recovery focus and uh, and at, whether it's abstinence based or harm you know harm reduction uh, sort of centered, which harm reduction uh, centered work is also. Um, pretty prevalent in the SUD community in terms of recovery, um, and so when you're in my in my in my view, when you're when you're locking folks up and you're forcing this kind of treatment, um, there really is no intrinsic reward. And if if there is a chance that folks are going to be you know locked up indefinitely or put in these places in these locks bed in, indefinitely, it really doesn't do anything but probably exacerbate exacerbate sort of mental health comorbidities that likely exist because of substance use. So I, I, I think the approach is, is going to find itself to be very harmful. And then when folks are released, uh, what is that going to look like then in terms of relapse and reuse? Where is the education on harm reduction? Are those things going to be, um, are those things going to exist in these, in these settings? And it's really hard to tell. Yeah, can you back up for a minute because I, I, some of our audience probably isn't familiar with what MAT means. Can you say what MAT is? Medication assisted treatment. So, uh, medication assisted treatment can look in the, uh, it, it can look in different ways, but essentially, um, uh, it's used a lot when it comes to de detoxing from uh, any sort of alcohol. Alcohol. So, so these are drugs. These are the, medications. They, they are medications. Okay. So, um, and there are various various medications that are used. I, I think a lot of folks are uh, for for folks who have used heroin or fentanyl or any sort of opiates. I think folks know um, about you know Suboxone uh, as as um, methadone. Methadone. These are all medications that are to support the recovery for for opiate addiction. 
Um, and they, they work if followed in a, in that sort of regimented schedule. Um, and so there is some impact there, but what that looks like in a, in a space where they're likely always going to be medicating you without that titrate down, right? Um, there could be some concerns there. Um, and I mean, I, you know, because I, I automatically compare it to the mental health context where I'm like, okay, in mental hospitals, Sometimes people refuse the treatment, right? Yeah. I mean, they refuse the drugs. And so I'm thinking, you know, I'm just thinking about all these parallels to SUD. And I'm like, okay, you're in this locked facility, you know, for SUD. What if you don't want that? What if you don't want to go to a group? What are we doing here? You know, and I, I mean, I just wonder, mm. you know, I, I mean, they can't, it's kind of ludicrous to be like, oh, we're going to do forced talk therapy. Like come sit in this group and you're forced to, you're forced to bear your soul. Like that doesn't work. You can't force people to speak. It's also a violation of their First Amendment rights. Um, But, um, you know, I mean, so it's like I sort of, you know, if somebody is really just my kind of person that's like super defiant. Yeah, (laughs) And it's like, okay, you know, like you picked me up. Go pound sand. I'm not going to cooperate with you. No, I don't want Matt. No, I don't want to go to your groups. And no, I don't want to be here. You know, at that point, I think it. To me, to my mind, when you start stripping away the sort of the extraneous, you know, the things that we're calling treatment, you start stripping it away, stripping it away. If the person won't engage, then I think at some point you're forced to admit that it's just jail, that yeah. that you're jailing someone for being addicted to a drug. And in order to restrict them from having access to that drug, which is what we do with crime. Right. I mean, right. that's why you're in jail. Right. To to part of it is restraint. Right. It's to it's to protect Um, from the ability to commit further, you know, crimes. Um, So, you know, I I mean, and that's one of the things that is really super concerning to me because, you know, we're seeing this, um, we're seeing so much in the law now, SUD and mental health move together without any nuance, without any distinction. And it's kind of like, I don't know, like, how do you feel? Like, are these really similar enough to be treated at the same way? No, I, I, I don't think that they are. Um, I think I think the type of because because in the same way that uh, there's you know internal medication resistance, right? The same the same thing works for people uh, with substance use disorder. Um, not all medications will work, and to your point, not everybody's going to talk about it. Not everybody uses because there's some sort of trauma impact. Not everyone. Um, not everyone uses all of the time. I mean, one thing that I think we're, we're kind of like flirting with and, and kind of dancing over, and it's the same thing for those that have a mental health crisis. If someone, you know, for example, relapses on a substance and they have one substance use related crises, uh, they can be, be locked in these facilities in the same way as someone who is having a severe mental illness related crisis. Right. And, that yeah, is frightening. Yeah, that is- it, you know, that's one of the things that's frightening to me, too, because, you know, the the trigger to all of this in some ways. Um, uh, I don't know exactly what I want to say here, but I mean, you know, it's it, it, in some ways it's like, OK, if you put somebody in a locked facility, like the mental health. I mean, excuse me, the substance use hospital, right? The substance use version of a mental hospital on those short-term holds, those last 77 days. And it is after that, that you can be conserved. You can be conserved a little earlier in the process, but typically speaking, that's how the public guardians and the court systems work. They want to see that you're not going to get sort of better in those 77 days before they place you under a conservatorship. And I'm like, okay, if they just forced you to be sober for 77 days, on what basis are they then placing folks into a conservatorship? You know, I mean, it seems like mm. risk of relapse, right? Or like right. I experience cravings, um, you know, and, and it's predictive too. I mean, that's one of the things that bugs me about it is like, I don't think SUD and serious mental illness are the same, um, you know, in terms of how they present, right? Like I have serious mental illness. That is a chronic condition. Um, you know, it, it, I may go through periods where I'm sick and periods where I'm well, periods where I'm competent, periods where I'm not right. I mean, it's sort of fluid and it can move. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's a permanent condition that will always present with 
some, you know, some level of need to remediate it. And, you know, I think I see with, you know, with the folks who are the most, have the most unremittent serious mental illness for whom these medications don't work very well, you know, that's where the state feels like it's justified to sort of have these endless, you know, custodial arrangements because this situation is kind of static. Now, I disagree. I don't think they try enough modalities. And I think that there's no, I think there's been basically zero self-reflection around, you know, how ableism and capitalism and sort of biological supremacy are tainting what we're doing and our ideas. But, you know, I mean, that's what's, that's what is like scary to me is, you know, people being placed in locked facilities based on risk of relapse. You know, you know, as you're mentioning this, I I smiled a little bit because, um, you know, I have, I have an intersection here, right? So I, I also uh, have lived experience with, with severe mental illness and I've been in recovery for, for that for about nine years. And I have a, a history of substance use, um, of which I've also been, you know, uh, I've been sober for, for nine years. And the thing is, in reflection, for me, uh, the treatments are completely separate. Yeah, there's some overlap, but, it, it you know, primary treatment for, for, for my mental illness uh, would not have kept me sober, right? Treatment for uh, just my substance abuse would n- definitely not have any sort of impact on severe mental illness. <laughs> yeah. So to, to even, like... To even even fathom or in my mind that this could be combined in the relative way is is so harmful um, because a lot of mental health crises for those who you know who suffer from addiction who live with addiction who are recovering from addiction um, they're they're substance dependent right like you know substance related psychosis right sometimes yeah. when you yeah. remove the substance uh, the psychosis is removed also. Right. Um, so it's not all the time that they're they're comorbid, and so the treatments are are vastly different, especially if there is medication resistance. Um, there is no, you know, there's not a functional long term medication for um, for anything really other than than opiates, and even that is supposed to be a system where you're you're slowly removing you know, methadone or Suboxone or things like that. So it's a completely different treatment uh, modality that I don't, I, I, I'm, I, I don't yet see how they're going to make this alliance because the, the recovery pathways are so different. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, and can you say, I mean, you know, you're, you're fancy, so you're also uh, going to get getting your, um, your side E. Yes. Um, <laughs> You're so fancy, um, but <laughs> but um, you know I know when we were talking about this too. Um, you know I asked you. You know, I I said, well, okay. Does forced treatment for SUD work? Is there any? Is there any studies? Are there any studies? Um, you know, is there any evidence that forcing someone to become sober um, leads to you know long term recovery? Well. First, let's talk a little bit about statistics, right? I know uh, in, in, you know, 12-step format programs, right, which are um, volunteer-based, typically unless they're they're court-driven or things like that, what what we know is roughly 10% of all people that come into any sort of recovery uh, from substance use voluntarily, only 10% are those who end up, um, you know, staying sober for a year. And then that number for five years goes down again to another 10%, right? 10% of those initial 10%. And that goes, you know, further and further along. And that's voluntarily, right? Yeah. So some of the some of the concerns that come up for me right away is, let's say after 77 days, someone um, is forced to be sober, right? But the... Um, so then they get released. They get released. However, the wellness support, the emotional support, the um, uh, the whole person-centered support is not present because of the, the conditions of the place that they're in. Uh, the first thing that, that happens is, is, is likely there will be relapse, right? And, and street drugs are very unpredictable um, in terms of the substances that they carry. And there's no telling how that, how that could, could go, right? Um, so let's say somebody is conserved and they're now 
you know, they've been given the option treatment or being conserved, which likely will then result back to treatment. Um, now there's, there's this forced, uh, there's this forced treatment modality that doesn't serve to have any, any sort of intrinsic reward. There is nothing that a person can get out of this unless they want to have sobriety, unless they want to be sober. Right. I think, right. I think that makes that's, sense to me. that's the critical component besides resilience, right? Which is inherent, right? Um, it's that desire to have something different and people, you know, you do see this in, in some prisons, people re sort of reform and kind of rebirth and, and those sort of things. But um, that may not always be the case for people with substance use disorder um, because the, the services, the needs of, of those services may not exist in, in, in these locked facilities. It's really hard to tell, but I don't, I don't think that that forced um, rehabilitation works. I don't, yeah. I don't see how it can work. Yeah, and and I I've seen referenced quite a bit since you know this has come up with this law that there's evidence that you know when folks are in a situation where where they're addicted but their access to drugs their ability to use is restricted then all of a sudden that restriction is removed that there's high overdose death rates. Yeah, imagine imagine you know take, uh, turning on a water hose and then squeezing it together and then suddenly releasing, right? It's just this flood of wanting to return to something that is is very comfortable. I mean, and then there's a criteria of how someone's using. Let's say they're experiencing homelessness, right? There's a lot of times that folks will, um, you know, they, they'll do substances that are, are, are stimulant-based so they can, they can stay awake through the night so that they find that they're safe. Maybe there's other criteria that uh, that decrease the amount of safety, or maybe they don't want their their things to be stolen. Maybe there's a, a need to be hyper vigilant, yep. and so these these other considerations um, ha have to be have to be made for some of the reasons why folks are using substances. Because what I'm getting from this, and I could be completely wrong, is that the target population that they're probably looking at is the homeless population. Who who have severe who may have severe mental illness, but also have that com comorbid with substance abuse disorder. Yeah, I mean, um, the the I mean the the law that they pass is very overbroad in that respect. It does not just apply to the unhoused. It applies to any substance in the DSM that you might use to a severe degree. So <laughs> that that list includes caffeine, folks. I mean, it's kind of wild. Like, you know, if what they were really after, you know, when you hear politicians talk about these laws, the way that they're advertised is, look, we're trying to save people's lives. Like right here, right now, we've got a situation where the person is incompetent. The person is at death's door. The person is refusing treatment. And that's why this is justified, right? That's how... That's how these laws are continuously talked about, but you read what's actually in the law and none of that's there, right? You don't have to be incompetent. You don't have to be a death store. Um, and, mm. um, you know, this this idea that, you know, it's um, that we're doing this to folks who, you know, only have, you know, are addicted to methamphetamine or they're addicted to fentanyl or they're addicted to heroin. No, we're doing this to people who have a substance use disorder for marijuana, you know? Yeah. And, you know, we don't know why that law was so overbroad other than there was discussion, you know, as that bill made it through the legislature that it shouldn't be that broad, that it shouldn't apply to any substance in the DSM, anything that can be the basis of a substance use disorder in the DSM, which is incredibly inclusive, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there, there are a lot of things in the DSM. If they're using diagnoses from the DSM without, you know, sort of specific, you know, criteria of, of of the disorders themselves, right? I mean, when we think of DSM, we we think of mood disorders, personality disorders, substance use disorders, but there are other disorders in there that I really hope that, you know, this excludes because then, you know, that, that could present other problems. Um, uh, I do want to do a little bit more research on the statistics of, uh, of forced treatment around substance abuse disorder and see what's there. And I'd love to have a conversation with you um, about it next time because I think... Uh, especially as we dive in a little bit more with um, uh, Senate Bill 43, this will be a good conversation to have to kind of explore a little bit more of that impact. And so I'll definitely have a lot more information for you all. You trying time. to wrap this up, Stefan? I am. I am. <laughs> all right, I, maybe I, it's time to wrap this up. Yeah, I mean, I, there's so much more we could say about it. And, you know, I think um, 
I think the uh, compare and contrast between serious mental illness and severe substance use disorder and where this is all going um, is really illuminating of, you know, attitudes um, towards both, you know, sets of um, populations and, and especially where, you know, there is a comorbid, comorbid illness. Um, but um, it's always great to get your perspective on these things as, you know, a person with lived experience and also all this education and, and all this navigating um, of these systems, um, you know, uh, yourself. And I will say, you know, one of the things that surprised me and, and hopefully we can talk about next time too, if you're, if you're, um, looking at statistics to look at is the federal substance, um, abuse and mental health services administration, SAMHSA, um, published, publishes data about substance use disorders and recovery. And according to them, 77% of all people who, um, have ever, um, expressed having a substance use disorder or in recovery. And then, you know, you wonder, you know, for the other 23%, is it that they are not yet, you know? But I thought that that was a pretty incredible statistic that really, you know, goes against forced treatment because like you said, you have to want it. I think we all understand that. You have to yeah. want to to take this step for yourself and there has to be, like you said, an intrinsic reward. Um, but also, you know, maybe a level of patience with it yeah. where, you um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I mean, I used to be seriously addicted to cigarettes and um, uh, it can take, you know, multiple attempts before you're yes. able to really, you know, leave that. And so I feel like in some ways using force is disrupting a natural process. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you know, 77 percent is is an incredible number, especially given that 10 percent that I that I'm talking about. Um, because the thing is, the one of the largest parts of of learning in recovery is relapse. Yeah, right? yeah. What 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 works? What didn't work? Same what are, with mental illness, really. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and that's really the 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 way you know. Some folks like myself, you know, we we uh, we try to get sober, and you know, we stay sober for a while. Um, I had a lot of supports. I had a lot of mental health services, SUD services, and I made sure to to use that. But I I wanted it because um, where I was before was not something that was life sustainable, right? right. Um, and I think it takes some time for folks to determine their own life sustainability and their own wants and why they want to be sober. Right. Some folks just don't want to go back to where they were. Right. Other folks see something better for themselves. Some folks have kids, right, or dogs or pets or loved ones that um, they want to be sober for or take care of or be present for. And so there are all of these other variables. And, uh, you know, I kind of mentioned it earlier. Resilience is another one. And resilience is not something that's empirically sound, right? It's not something that you can quantify. And so, um, so yeah, a, lo a lot of folks, and, and I, what I'd wager is that 23% just don't know yet. Right, right. right. Or on the fence. Yeah, right? and I, I mean, and I think, you know, as um, – as we've gotten to know each other and have these conversations, I think one of the things that we've both identified is that it's the folks with lived experience who understand recovery and recovery is the word that the mental health consumer movement uses too, yeah. right? We refer to medications as the medical model. We refer to these social systems of coercion, force and control um, as the medical model. And we talk with a different language. We talk about recovery, which is a thing that, you know, for me means learning, like encountering my disability in the, my pursuit of happiness and overcoming things, overcoming barriers that it presents, you know, as I'm moving towards um, a definite point. Yeah. And I think, you know, the medical model just doesn't understand that it's, it's reduced symptoms, it's eliminates symptoms. And it doesn't, I, I find still that the culture, you know, in psychiatry, um, I think it's probably better in substance use than it is in psychiatry. This is anathema to them. They don't understand. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I talk to people all the time and, and it sort of like blows your mind because, you know, we have these sort of like 
probation like programs for people with serious mental illness and and all of this you know kind of weak sauce programming where it's like go sit in this group and say what your coping skill is and that's what we're going to yeah. do for 15 years right. you know where it's just like it's kind of ludicrous that you would even refer to this as treatment and again like for us like treatment is completely distinct from recovery and we are interested in recovery we are interested in people's quality of life yeah and and recovery is a hundred percent possible and and really with the right services it's it's expected right and i think um i i agree with you that that treatment related uh approach is symptom reduction right yes. and we're talking about overcoming that using our our inner resilience um to recover and i think uh i think that's important um we have bounced well, I know, I know. We're rambling at this point, <laughs> Sorry, but I do. Everyone. I think it's a great. I think it's a great, like, you know, tone, uh, you know, thing to wrap up on is um, uh, recovery and that it's possible. And both of us were in a bad way for a That's long true. time, <laughs> and we're both people, um, you know, who are now happy and healthy and have purpose, and um, you know, are looking to to serve our community and, and, you know, um, inspire and support folks to do the same thing because recovery is possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today on our, on our rant, uh, <laughs> about stuck in LA and substance abuse and recovery. Thank you so much, Claire, for once again, uh, running the helm with me here and, uh, be sure to like, and subscribe and we will see you next time. All right, thanks. Bye, everyone.